Okay, we are live. Uh, so for those listening at home, welcome to the Live from the Sword Coast podcast. My name is Kevin Madison, and I will be your friendly dungeon user this evening. Uh, tonight, it's going to be the gearbook uh, that's been published for uh, Mongoose Publishing's second edition uh, Traveler role-playing game. Um, but before I launch into that, I just want to quickly mention that uh, we uh, have started a fundraising uh, initiative on the channel, and uh, that is called uh, Heroes Save Villages. Uh, you can find information about Heroes Save Villages, uh, the fundraising campaign, at uh, a link in the video description. Uh, I would ask that you please consider clicking through and uh, taking a look at uh, what we're trying to do with this campaign. And uh, if you are so inclined, um, uh, you are welcome to donate to the campaign as well, too. Um, the charity that we're benefiting is something called SOS Children's Villages uh, International. You can find information about them on the site as well. And I've included a link to the video description uh, that I've, uh, or the video I've posted to describe the, the why, I, you know, why we're doing this on the channel, uh, what the reasons for were, and uh, and to reiterate again too that this is a completely optional thing. If you don't feel like clicking through, um, it's no harm, no foul. Um, it's just an effort by us to try and um, give a little something back, I suppose, with our uh, our activities here. So, um, anyway, with that uh, mentioned, um, let's get on to the review. So. This particular game is, or this source book, actually, give me one moment here. I want to make sure that we're actually streaming here uh, because I have had issues uh, in the past with this. Uh, so let's see here. Um, it does appear that this is streaming, so that is great. Okay, cool. So um, as I said, this is a source book that is uh, published for the second edition of Traveler, uh, which is a hard science fiction role-playing game published by Mongoose Publishing. I have, uh, I've actually done a review of the core rulebook as well, and if I was not such a bonehead, I would include a link in the uh, description of the video before I went live, but I forgot to do that, but I will do that as soon as we uh, we wrap up here. So let's talk about what this uh, book is. As with um, most of my reviews, and I'm gonna try and organize this in a uh, kind of a, a logical manner where I'm talking about who this is for, you know, uh, what you do with this book. This is not a, an actual individual role-playing game, so there's going to be less really to talk about. Really, what we're, what I'd like to do is bring you through a the contents of the book. And I'm going to try something a little new tonight and make use of the PDF version of uh, the Central uh, Supply Catalog that I have. So um, the Central Supply Catalog, as background, the Central Supply Catalog is what Traveler has always called its sort of its gear book. And that's not uh, the things that are not in this book are things like uh, vehicles and starships, um, worlds, stuff like that. Like what the Central Supply Catalog is, the stuff for the most part that your players can pick up and carry. So it's guns, it's electronic equipment, it's armor. Um, it's I mean, there are some pieces of artillery in here that I will mention when we get to that, uh, that caught my player's eye at one point. But it's really kind of all the, the loot, you know, that uh, the players could be recovering. Now, for those unfamiliar with Traveler in general, uh, Traveler is a hard science fiction role playing game that is it's, it's presented as a kind of generic role playing game that you could use to, to you know, run anywhere uh, or use it to run any kind of setting. But in reality, I mean, I find that there are a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff that that is included in the game, the technology, the starships, the you know, the assumption about worlds, the assumption about travel, the, the assumptions about um, markets and, and uh, trading and stuff like that in the core rulebook. A lot of that is uh, makes assumptions that you're using the original Traveler universe, the the default setting of the Third Imperium. Um, this supplement does very much of that as well too. It, it, it's sort of uh, the assumptions in terms of what technology is available at what stage uh, because in the traveler role-playing game the way that they gauge how advanced tech is is through this abstract kind of uh, categorization called tech level and the tech level stuff in this game adopts the or rather in this supplement adopts the uh, tech level approach that is used in the um in the traveler uh, original traveler universe what that means is you know, things like um, biotech and like uh, advanced uh, cyber tech and stuff like that isn't necessarily going to isn't going to happen at the earlier levels. This isn't uh, like a uh, cyberpunk type game where you're going to see really advanced nanotech and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, uh, nano hacking and blah, blah, blah. Um, that stuff is it, it comes at, at higher tech levels. So 
Um, now, that's not to say that you couldn't repurpose this stuff. It's just as we're going through this, I'm, I'm not going to mention again, uh, you know, again and again, how this is the way it only works in that particular setting. But that's what the assumptions are in the book. If you're using some of the assumptions, um, in particular, like the tech levels, the legality levels, things like that, those are assumptions made about one setting. So if you were going to use this for your own setting, it is certainly, to be clear, this traveler role playing game is certainly robust enough for you to repurpose it for you know, any number of different uh, settings. It's a really, really great and fun and quick playing uh, system. And, um, and so, so the book gives you some, you know, if what you want is a bunch of stats for like laser guns and uh, plasma guns and like psi knives and stuff like that, uh, uh, some, you know, quick and easy rules for robots and for, um, for computers and stuff like that, then this is a great supplement. You know, uh, you just need to, you would want to probably ignore the tech levels or just reorganize them into whatever you thought was appropriate. Now, having said that, you know, realistically, um, like in my particular uh, game, I've got uh, two crews now of uh, travelers that, that I run uh, games for, and both of them are set in a region of space in the third Imperium setting uh, called the Trojan Reach or the Trojan Reaches. Uh, in that region, there are you know, historically now collapsed uh, empires that were incredibly advanced technologically speaking. Um, it's sort of like a, an interesting no man's land or kind of like wild frontier kind of place with with the mix of like lost civilizations and shit like that in there. So what that means is that there's a wide variety of different tech levels. So um, while certain the tech levels provide you with some understanding of what you could go to a certain starport and pick up and whatnot, what you find in the field may be very different than that or what you find people carrying around, you know, there may be a, a very, very primitive star Viking kind of character or like space uh, uh, raider, you know, pirate who barely, you know, operates at like a Victorian level of technology in terms of like um, what they can actually do, but they're carrying around a, a laser sword or something like that, you know, because it's something they've uh, pillaged from somebody else. So um, if you, if you don't, or if you're not terribly concerned about that then this is something you could easily use for any other setting because if it fits in the Trojan reaches you could easily repurpose it for for your settings so let's talk about what is in the book now the book is the there, there's sort of two different parts uh, to the to the book that i'm going to talk about one of them is the the gear itself which is the vast majority of the book and then there's a very small little section at the beginning that is rules oriented and i you know, I, I sort of the first couple of times I went through it because there's so many pretty pictures of, of weapons and stuff like that and, and uh, equipment and the armor, you know, which all looks really cool. I sort of got lost by the glitz. And then it wasn't until I actually started running the game that I, I went back and dove back into the first section. And there's some really fucking great rules in there for, for DN to use to structure a kind of, you know, the sandbox style of play that that uh, Traveler uh, seems to lend it towards or lend itself towards. So. Let's take a look at the um, the actual book. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share screens over here. Now, unfortunately, I don't think I can have a, my own, yeah, I think my picture's gonna be gone, so you're just gonna be stuck with my voice. But this is, let's see if it's working properly. It is, look at that. Boom, present to everyone. And uh, I cannot put my little, my own little picture in there. So this is the central supply catalog. This is the, um, PDF version, and that is the cover. Um, pretty cool representation of what you know life might be like inside some kind of spaceport that you may have went to. Although with the weapons that are displayed there, the spaceport either has really, really liberal uh, gun laws or, or has a very, very low law level, <laughs> or you, um, you know, uh, it's stuff that's going to get boxed up in, in a very, very secure manner or delivered to your, your uh, uh, ship. But uh, let's see here. This is, okay, it's written by uh, Matt Spren, who is uh, kind of like the, I think, one of the major mucky mucks over at uh, Traveler, uh, and, or at uh, Mongoose, I should say. So this is the uh, introduction. Uh, there's a little blurb here about the Third Imperium. And uh, what it says is there's actually some technology in here that is actually not available, uh, generally speaking, in the Third Imperium setting. Uh, so I'm not, I honestly don't remember what stuff that is, so I'm not really going to well on that too much but here's an example of one of the very cool things that the second edition traveler books uh include in in all of their books which is sort of in universe advertising which is great here it's a mega sale of aries quaid guns goods and beyond love that uh and my players actually have when i uh 
did my our gaming marathon recently. I brought a couple extra copies of uh, Central Supply Catalog, so we'd have enough to to read. And uh, this was one of the things that the guys pointed out. All right, so the first uh, section, this is that first section that I mentioned that I sort of overlooked. And this is the stuff that's particularly useful for DMs or for um, referees, I think it's called in Traveler. Uh, what this is, is some supplemental rules for whether you can gain access to certain equipment, right? So like if this is a, the, a massive book of 154 pages full of really great gear. and Unless you're playing in a uh, setting where the characters are at incredibly advanced and low level, you know, or rather low tech level, rather, I'm sorry, low law level places, um, then with, with a you know, significant population, then there's going to be a question as to whether or not they're actually able to access the, um, the, uh, the gear they're looking for. So what this does is it gives you some rules for determining whether or not the uh, equipment is legally available uh, for uh, for purchase wherever they, they happen to be. And modifiers you can see here are things like if the item is considered heavily specialized, if it's typically reserved for military use, um, how many tech levels away from the world is this item? You know, if you're trying to get something that is either substantially more advanced or substantially more primitive than what you're gonna get at the, um, you know, than what uh, the, ambient sort of uh, culture has, then you're gonna find it difficult. You know, uh, finding a flint knife uh, on board the enterprise is gonna be a tricky endeavor, right? Uh, whereas, you know, uh, in a medieval level technology uh, planet, it will be hard to get your hands on a fusion gun, you know? So uh, there's also options to, to pay more to, to pay double the price, pay triple the price, uh, the nature of the starport, the population of the world, and then the different trade codes that are uh, that apply. All that stuff comes from the uh, the the rules that you have in the core rulebook for uh, describing different uh, different worlds. So what this is is just sort of a um, a way to just randomly determine if you, if you're uh, if you want to just, uh, leave it to the you know uh, the dice to figure out whether this thing's available or whether they need to go somewhere else. Uh, this is your option. But if this is only uh, legally. Uh, if they don't want to purchase it legally, then they can go to the black market. And there's some great rules in here for the black market as well. Uh, this, These rules in particular, I really, really like. Uh, for my, one of my crews, the um, the crew, we randomly generated the cargo uh, that was on their ship, the Delphi. And one of the cargo pieces, and forgive me if you're a regular listener to our traveler stuff, so you've heard this story a bunch of times, but we randomly generated the cargo to include a bunch of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons are incredibly illegal in pretty much every developed system so what we've been doing is using the black market rules to figure out where they could actually sell these things you know and it's it's great it's, it's proven to be a lot of fun and uh it's given a great incentive for the players to really look at the map of the uh, subsector and the, and the broader sector and try and figure out, okay, well, we can go here and try and sell these things here because this place is at a lower law level, but it actually has a decent population level and, and so forth. So that's, that's awesome. Um, and then if you happen to screw up your role, uh, everything in, in, uh, in the market um, transactions and stuff in uh, Traveler generally uses, you know, either your broker or your streetwise skill. And, one of the things that happens is if you really, you know, screw up your streetwise check when you're trying to look in the black market for something illegal, you could generate a response from the law enforcement that can range from just someone checking, like wanting to check your comms or check your, you know, your ID, all the way down to you're arrested, and that's awesome. I think that's really really cool. It uh, because that is a consequence that's been kicking around out there for my players. Like the way that it works is all task resolution in, in Traveler is 2D6. Uh, and you add those together and then you add your applicable skill and then you compare that to a target number, usually around eight. Uh, that's the default uh, difficulty. Um, in a black market situation, what you're doing is applying a negative penalty of the difference between when the thing you're trying to sell or the thing you're trying to buy is illegal. And for nuclear weapons, they're illegal everywhere. So it's a zero. And whatever the and the law level is in the uh, the place you find yourself. So law level for most civilized places is like a six or a seven. So that's like minus six or a minus seven to the dice results, which means 
more often than not, they're going to be getting a pretty negative result. So, um, so that's been a really interesting, I don't know. I mean, it adds a lot of atmosphere to the, the considerations. You know, our, my players have spent a lot of time both online and offline talking about, you know, when are we going to, you know, what, what's it, what are we going to set up as sort of the response for when we make this role to try and get the fuck out of Dodge if things go poorly, you know? Uh, so that's really cool. Um, and that, uh, I imagine that, you know, obviously nuclear weapons is a pretty extreme result of, or example of this, but um, I think it, it would absolutely apply to, or uh, could apply for any kind of weapon. You know what I'll do here? Give me a second. I'm just going to quickly alter this so that uh, we can show two pages. Maybe that might be two pages for one. No, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Where are you? Up, up, um. I don't know why that is not working. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get it to show uh, two pages at the same time, but he's not doing it. Two page view. What's going on? Do this. Sorry, I'm going to fuss this with, with this for one time. This is what, what happens when I try and do something I've not done before. What are you doing? Game? Jeez. Let's see here. No, no, no. Sorry. All right, so I, I will have to fuss with this uh, in between uh, this and the next time I broadcast, try and make it look a little better. But anyway, that is... Okay, so that is the first section. Uh, then there are some new rules that introduce uh, a couple new weapon traits. The weapon traits are things that, that uh, kind of specialize or modify what the, um, you know, what, what special effects the weapons can have in, uh, in combat. And they give some rules for forward observers. So if you're playing a game that is a little more military oriented, uh, where they're playing, you know, you're playing mercenaries or, uh, you know, kind of like a shadow runners type thing, uh, this might be, you know, this might be stuff that um, would be applicable. Uh, I, my, my two campaigns are, uh, uh, one is uh, people running a starport and one is uh, people running a ship. So this is not, you know, uh, not going to be applicable for me. Though once they become pirates in my Pirates of Drenax campaign, maybe this stuff will be more applicable. But in any way, um, then we get into some more atmospheric art, and we get into the actual supply catalog itself. So this is uh, some of the um, section divider and uh, images, and that's pretty freaking cool. A little sci-fi or high-tech looking uh, shotgun there. And uh, this first bit is the armor. So the armor in here is uh, is incredibly comprehensive. Like the, the a number of different things that you have to pick from in here is uh, is pretty great. So I'll just sort of flip through here and I'll just comment on stuff as it comes up. Like check it out. You got some post-apocalyptic armor there. So if you're visiting a uh, savage or ravaged kind of world, like say the surface of Drinax, which was uh, bombed and blasted into oblivion 200 years prior to the Pirates of Drinax campaign, well, then the post-apocalyptic armor would probably show up. Um, one thing I did notice is I think there's a screw up in the art on one of these things. This is a carryover from the uh, rule book. The, this is what's described as cloth here. So take a look at that picture, the bottom there, that is, is what's called cloth. But it's described as a heavy duty coverall tailored from ballistic cloth. <laughs> like that to me looks like actual armor. And I think that what happened is maybe there was a miscommunication in the layout and this was screwed up and then that screw up was covered or carried over between the two uh, uh, books, between the core rule book and this one. Um, this uh, here, the protect suit, which is proven to be very popular with both uh, crews that I have in my game right now. It's this, uh, a slim fitting business suit woven from protective fibers. The protect suit is obviously armor, but it also confers a degree of respectability without making the traveler appear like a thug. Uh, it is capable of turning melee weapons while softening the blow of small arms fire. Now, this particular game doesn't really have a, uh, a massive spread in terms of the numbers for like what's you know a, a relatively weak armor and what's a relatively highly protective armor, and the reason for that is because the uh, the damage dice of, of um, guns don't don't really go you know the the high end of what you'll get shot with in uh, in this game is usually about like ten d six, which is a lot. I mean that, like sixty damage will vaporize most people, but it keeps it still at a minimal range. That's an average roll of ten d six is about thirty five. So 35 with some decent armor on it, you actually might live uh, through that. Uh, so depending on how, uh, you know, what your physical stats are like. But uh, anyway, the, um, 
uh, I, I actually like that because we, you know, uh, it sets sort of a, a range. Um, I am a, um, a long-time GURPS player uh, as well, and GURPS just uses sort of the logarithmic, uh, ex, you know, growth on it, and you end up with, in some high-tech armor, like, you know, hundreds, like 200 or 300 armor, just to mitigate, to mitigate against just how much damage some of these other things do. And that is, I, it makes absolute sense, and it is logical, and it is how things would be, if you know you're applying real world logic or real world physics to things, but it makes for a really unplayable kind of uh, combat game. So this makes uh, high combat games a lot more uh, possible because they're keeping it in that relatively reasonable range. Then we get into archaic armor. So if you want to, you know, play out to your travelers visiting a Renfair planet, or you want to try and you know do some time travel stuff, or because that's you know uh, high sci-fi has kind of got some of that stuff in it. There's a lot of stuff there. Then there is some uh, specialized anti-energy um, armor in here. Uh, this is stuff that's pretty much going to be used only in really high-tech settings. Um, and what else here? Then you have boarding vac suit, which to me looks an awful lot like the uh, Master Chief uh, suit from uh, Halo, but uh, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Um, one neat thing here, too, is they give you the ele electronic suite. So if uh, certain armors um, depending on the tech level, it'll tell you what the default electronics built into your armor is. Another nice thing with this as well is that you have the ability to uh, customize a lot of these armor. Uh, there are options to add different, um, you know, different features into your to your armor, and that's included in this section as well. We get into combat armor, I believe. This is actual. Yeah, here we go. Some ceramic combat armor, generic combat armor, combat environment suit. Okay, so this thing here, I think is maybe what was intended to be the cloth armor, but I could be wrong because it, it is, um, it does look like it. The description is, is fairly similar here as well. Um, some more progressively more protective suits. Then we get to the hostile environment back suit. Um, some Sane stuff here, rescue suit. And then we get into powered armor. This shit is pretty cool looking. This is pretty tough stuff as well, too, but it is also quite pricey. Generally speaking, when you're starting off the game, uh, your characters are not, pro your travelers are probably not going to start with stuff worth more than about 10,000. Uh, and they can start with more money than that, but they can't spend it before they get in the game. And, and the reason being, I, I understand it, is so that they've got shit to do in the game. You know, it's not like a fantasy role playing game where you're hopping into the game and then you're going to you know, get hired by someone at a, and whatever, and then you know, at a tavern, and then go or find a map or blah blah blah. And you can do that stuff, but if all you want to do is just sort of like be in the world, um, there's good incentives for your characters to go and interact with that world because you know they got a they just got out of um, whatever it is they came in from before, they got discharged from the military, they got out of their journalistic uh, you know, um, contract, or they got out of you know, they away from their noble parents who are you know, were uh, um. Uh, controlling their lives, and now they got their fat, you know, uh, retirement fund or severance pay or whatever, and they want to go out and spend some of this money because that's what they want to do. And uh, using the rules for availability for uh, black market, and then the rules out of the core rule book gives you really fun things to happen, you know, as they're going about and doing that. But the reason I mention that is because a lot of the prices of these things here, uh, they are way more than ten thousand. Uh, powered plate here, that awesome tank-looking thing there. It kind of reminds me, honestly, of like a He-Man character. Um, about 50,000 credits for the TL-10 version and 85,000 credits for the TL-14 version. Pretty cool. These are the modifications here. This is the stuff that you can add to your armor as well. My players have made great use of this stuff, and I think this gives a really fun set of options that your players can do. Like One of my players had a, a shit ton of money, so he got his um, protect suit, and he's got a bunch of really neat stuff built into it. So there's a, there's a computer in it, and there's, uh, I can't remember what else he's got in there, but there's some neat features he's got built right into his suit. And for a sci-fi game, that's uh, kind of what you want your characters to do, is take advantage of the uh, technology that's available in that setting. Yeah, another cool uh, illustration about, um, I can't remember, is it, I think it's Battle Dress, maybe? Um, speaking of Battle Dress, now we get into this. So the difference between Power Armor and Battle Dress is that... Uh, Power armor is just uh, armor that it, it's pretty much just like like you know personal armor that happens to have some um, 
you know, strength augmenting features in it to help you move a little better and help you carry your uh, bigger things. Battle dress is sort of like a step towards being an actual mech. You know, it's uh, it's not like a full-sized vehicle uh, by any means, and there are mechs in the vehicle handbook, which I'll review at another time. Battle dress is sort of like that mid-ground. It's sort of like your, your Iron Man kind of uh, stuff. So there's a bunch of different varieties in here, which, uh, you know, artillery, assault, battle, regular battle dress, uh, ceramic battle dress, um, combat pioneer battle dress, command battle dress, uh, logistic battle dress, side commando battle dress. And because it's the same figure that's pretty much in all of these things, I picture this as an actual in-universe document where, you know, there is some uh, model that's having this uh, holographically projected onto him so you can see what this character looks like. Um, I, I should mention too, like the, the art in here is awesome. I really, really love this stuff. It totally gets me into the world of the, um, of the third Imperium and helps me visualize what this world is like. And also check out that uh, side commando battle dress. So this is something that maybe this Odani would use in, uh, for their commandos in, uh, the what he calls in the original traveler universe um i intend to use this in my campaign uh because the zodani in the original traveler universe uh, there is no technological teleporter that people use you have to move from one ship to another by using uh, shuttles um but the zodani are a, an empire that was founded by offshoots of humanity and they use they are they embrace psionics uh, wholeheartedly uh it, up from you know from the most basic level of their uh, civilization from artists and uh you know um teachers and so forth right up into the military and uh, one of the psionic powers is for teleporting so what they do is they use side commandos who, who are psychic and they scout out the enemy vessels using uh clairvoyance then they teleport in there using the teleport power and once they recover from that, they then go and um, wreck holy hell on whatever planet or whatever planet, whatever vessel they happen to teleport on. And that would be what you'd be seeing going through the smoke and the laser beams and so forth. And I think that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, Sign enhanced battle dress, uh, scout battle dress, and then again, more modifications. And these are specialized for battle dress because it's just, it's a, a heavier frame that you can add more stuff to. This is a really great way of like not only doing the kind of Boba Fett thing and specializing your your armor, but it's also a way of kind of making certain uh, you know worlds or whatever else feel special. Uh, so, for instance, there are in the Pirates of Drenax campaign, they use these rules to basically create the Hawk Guards, which are uh, the sort of like ceremonial guards for the uh, royalty of uh, Drenax, and they have these very advanced uh, anti gravity belts and these massive like uh, ceremonial wings on the back. But it's all stuff that you find in here, you know, and, and they build it that way. So it's, it's, it serves as a, um, a great example of what kind of, you know, uh, really unique cultural thing you could build with, um, you know, with these rules. So then we get into sort of the more like prosaic gear. And, um, you know, having run a lot of more uh, like traditional fantasy type games the last little while, I, I've still found it really interesting to see what my players did with this whole section. So what this does is it offers you, you know, um, by different categories. So this is all survival gear, like a grav, parachute, parachute, squirrel suit, stuff like that. There's tons of illustrations in here as well. Um, again, look at these illustrations. That's great stuff. Uh, and, you know, Arctic and cold environments, desert and arid environments. Uh, marine environments. There's all sort of very cool survival stuff, and a lot of the stuff has illustrations to go with it, which uh, one of my players in particular has said he loves so much. He's mentioned it many, many times because he bitches that Shadowrun doesn't do this, and you know Star Wars doesn't do this. Why don't they do that? Because this just makes it so much more interesting to read and, and easier to visualize in your character's hand. Uh, vacuum environments, you know, all sorts of cool stuff. Your general survival gear in here, and the pictures of the stuff. And this stuff runs the, the gamut from low tech stuff like just knives and like, you know, matches all the way up to, you know, a protein tap, a um, rad blanket, you know, portable fusion generator. So there's some really great stuff uh, to be found in here. And, okay, here's more wilderness housing, uh, which is gives you some good ideas. Like this stuff was uh, helpful for me to try and visualize what 
the technology level, what the ambient technology level in the third imperium is like. Like what what would they if they have a um, you know a temporary uh, science station on a on a planet or on a comet or something like that. Maybe they use something like this here on the bottom that that uh, that housing that's down there. So if that's the case, it gives me the stats of what's available, you know, how you get in there and, and so forth. And then once I know what that tech is, I can then use that to kind of, you know, uh, create the, the story that they're going to be, you know, interacting with. Some other neat stuff you can add on to customize your home. Uh, then some electronic stuff like uh, chem goggles, Geiger counter, and so forth. Um, communication stuff, which is, is really great. Uh, in the default traveler setting, there is no such thing as interstellar uh, or faster than light uh, communication. So, uh, and also on a lot of the planets you're going to, um, at least in the, you know, if you're going to Spinner Marches or you're going to the Trojan Reaches or to the Great Rift, uh, there's probably not going to be a, you know, local telecommunication network, you know, global network. So what you, what this does is it tells you what kind of communications uh, or what, how far the different kind of communications go. And that is really interesting because it, it plays with the expectations of the players i think i think they go in is what they a lot of players coming into traveler for the first time that i found at least they they tend to forget what they've got you know how just how high tech stuff is but it's also interesting to then throw them back into how frontier things feel when that tech doesn't you know it, it isn't omniscient you know or omnipresent at least you know when they have something like well shit i can't contact anyone with this thing because uh, I'm too far away, you know, or I don't have line of sight or, or whatever the, the limitation is. So it's it's interesting to see characters both feel liberated by having, well, I got a comm unit that's effectively as intense or as as, um, as useful as what my, um, you know, what my modern cell phone could be. But it's, um, you know, so it's only got a range of uh, 50 kilometers or 50 miles or whatever it is. Uh, let's see, we have gadgets and essentials in here too. Ring laser is something that one of my players absolutely loved. Uh, it's a laser that is built into a ring. It is unfortunately a very high uh, technology thing, so they weren't able to start with one, but boy, they went looking for it quick. Next up is a section on computers and software, and this is uh, some really good rules that are very simple and, uh, and easy to implement and kind of eyeball at the table for how you judge the sort of processing power of different computers and, and how, what kind of programs, which are looked at here, the software pro, uh, packages, what kind of programs you can fit on them. And that's another really neat little thing. So what, what we did is one of the players had a, I believe he had a, a cerebral implant that, uh, so he had, he had uh, cyber eyes and he had some kind of uh, cerebral implant as well to like a comm unit. But it was advanced enough that it could maintain a, uh, a certain level of program so basically he had like a uh, an ai that looked like excuse me it looked like the projection that um ryan reynolds character had not ryan reynolds what's his name um shit ryan gosling the other ryan ryan gosling's character had in the new blade runner film where, where he could and in, in his it wasn't that it was projected out and, and anyone could see that it was uh synced to his cyber eye so only he could see this and that's how he interacted with his computer and it was really cool, you know, it added a nice little extra little sci-fi kind of touch to it. And it gave him more opportunity to role play with the environment because he was role playing with his AI friend. And that was, uh, that was pretty awesome. Um, next section is adding robots in. Now, this could just be me. Um, so I, there's one thing that I have found to be a problem with, uh, with robots in this particular game. Uh, and it's the same problem I have with the, the, um, the animals in it. And that's that, so what you see here is what the stats are for the different robots. The thing is, there isn't any actual stats for them. So like, if you want to figure out what the difficulty would be for a character to wrestle a robot to the ground, in particular, you can see there's a, you know, there's a human-sized robot there. So I don't know if he's a uh, labor robot or, or what, but um, there, there aren't rules for that. There aren't any rules for what the strength or the, you know, like how difficult that would be for, for these things. Uh, the, re the other problem with that is that because you don't know what the stats are, there's no other modifiers that are applied to their skills. So their skills are just rolled kind of as is, which means that in some cases they can be inferior to what the players are. Now, 
for the ones that are listed in this rule book and for the, the um, animals as well too, the skills tend to be fairly high. Like it, it's a decent bonus, like a plus three or a plus two. Um, but looking at the protocol droid here, you know, like he has zero, no training whatsoever in um, unarmed combat. Uh, so this is something, and I guess that like, why would a protocol droid be trained that way? But if my players, which you know, being the devious people they are, want to convert this thing into something that's going to be more combative. Well, like, what's the what? What is the when I'm contesting the one of these things against one of my players? How do I measure that? And uh, it may very well be in the rule book uh, somewhere that I have overlooked, but I have not found that. And that problem it, it carries over to the robots as well because they adopted the same approach they did for how they model animals. Or non sentient species in uh, Traveler, it's the same way here. So, so anyway, uh, but that said, with that limitation applied, it gives you some really great ideas for sample robots in here, you know, running from security drones to creeper assassins to uh, skin jobs to, uh, you know, full um, replicant style kind of things. Urban pacification robot. Of course, my players really wanted to pick up, you know, the Ed 209 looking urban pacification. The urban pacification robot uh, when their in their patron just offered to uh, you know, finance whatever reasonable gear they needed to set up their spaceport. Uh, me as the DM told them that their patron did not feel they needed an urban pacification police robot on an abandoned planet. So no dice for them, but you may be a more generous DM than I. Um, then next up is tools and engineering. Just some uh, neat stuff in here. And there's uh, every one of these things too. If there are any um, rules, like skill, uh, not skills, uh, any rules elements, it's included right in the description. So that's great. But it's usually very simple, like a, a just a dice modifier that these things will offer, or they'll just allow you to do stuff, right? Like it's it's sort of a binary thing. You cannot cut through a, a metal hull unless you've got a laser torch or something, you know, more powerful. Uh, we then get into medical supplies, which is pretty great. Uh, then some drugs and pharmaceuticals, which the, um, my players also looked over uh, to see if there was stuff they could make uh, effective use of. Uh, then there is personal augmentation, which is uh, cyberware. And this is a greatly expanded section from what's available in the core rulebook. So if uh, as a character, you roll up that you've got some augmentations as part of your uh, one of the rewards from your um, your life path, this really gives you a lot more options to, to pick from. So it, it, even just for that, it's it's uh, it's really helpful. Uh, and there's some really neat options in here as well. Uh, then we get on to home comforts. Now this section you would think is just silly. It's all fluff stuff. Who the hell cares about a holographic play table or a high fidelity music system or a home theater or whatever? Well, I mentioned earlier about how I expected the players wouldn't really care too much about this stuff because you know if i'm coming from a, like a pathfinder thing they're trying to find stuff to make themselves more you know uh, combat optimized or you know to, to benefit their skill their spell casting abilities or whatever well one of my players took great care to pick out a number of different things that were within his budget to make sure he could set up on their which is the the crew that was setting up a new um a uh taking over a, a spaceport and he made a point of picking out all this cool shit just to make it feel like a man cave, you know, kind of place. And he used it in the game when then really creepy shit started happening after they crash landed on this planet on the same uh, on that world. They had a uh, problem with one of the maneuver drive as they were landing and uh, they had some creepy shit happen. And then he used that stuff. And I love that. I thought that was really, really it's another way to bring the characters and, or the players, I should say, into the game. And, and I love that. So I totally uh love that they included all this kind of you know like an auto laundry um <laughs> my player was very happy that he had a laundry um you know there was laundry service on the on the ship now because of his auto laundry and that, that's it's great i mean like of course that would be something the players would or the characters themselves would be quite happy to have um then we get into speaking of uh, weapons we get start into the uh section of, of weaponry so it starts off here with uh, bludgeoning Weaponry, which runs the gamut from very low tech stuff like clubs to an anti armor flail, which is effectively like a grenade or a shaped charge on the end of a mace. Well, that is awesome. And cool things like gravity hammers and saps and, you know, um, static maul, sunstick, 
arc shield weapon, which is kind of like a lightsaber-ish. Uh, and yeah, I'll just keep flipping through here. There's there's illustrations for every single thing in here, and that uh, I, I agree with my player. I think that's a really really smart idea, and it really makes it a beautiful book just to flip through, even just to get ideas too. You know, like looking at some of this stuff and thinking of like you know, oh, like the side blades, right? Like I, I've been the uh, Zodani. Uh, are going to be playing a, a pretty significant role in my Pirates of Drenax campaign. I love the idea of like being able to sh show my players and say, "Hey, this is this is what uh, you know the uh, uh, Zodani assassin uh, who um, jumped you. This is what he had on him. You know, this this thing that if you've got second powers, it, it uh, glows this eerie blue power, you know, power field around it." Um, other neat things: static blades, stone axe. So if you really want to, uh, you know, fight uh, space men versus uh, Cavemen, you got your stone axe rules there. Uh, brass knuckles, garrote, uh, piston fist, which is pretty cool. It's basically like a, uh, um, well, it's a piston fist. <laughs> so, uh, what else here? Then we got some shields, uh, both uh, low tech and high tech. Uh, and then they're getting to slug weapons or advanced weapons, to do slug rifles, which are pretty cool. Big game rifles. Um, now, because of the price of a lot of these things, I found that the out of the core rulebook, the default sort of best option is the um, advanced combat rifle, and that kind of remains the same. Like uh, there's there's a lot of really great stuff that you can get if you've got more money than the ten thousand dollar limit or ten thousand credit limit. Uh, maybe it's five thousand. Anyway, it's it's ten or five, whatever the limit is. Advanced combat rifle is usually your your sort of best uh, best bet as a starting weapon. Uh, it, it fits within the TL-12 that you're allowed to purchase to start with, and everything else that's even within that price range uh, is usually out, like the mag rail rifle is unfortunately out of your price range, or out of your uh, tech level you can start with, if you're going with the default rules, but certainly plenty of cool shit to pick up in-game once you get into the game. You know, ghost rifles, ghost sniper rifles, pretty cool. Uh, then energy pistols here, matter disintegrator, not bad. Um, and more advanced energy rifles here, solar beam rifle, maser, uh, and then we get into grenades, which are give you a nice selection of grenades, so, so should your characters be inclined towards that. More archaic ranged weapons in here too, crossbows, uh, regular bows, um, slings. Uh, then we get into the heavy weaponry, which is getting more into the mill spec kind of range here. And then into the actual artillery. Now this section really uh, on its own is not super helpful uh, because you've got nothing to use it against necessarily. You would never use this shit on your players individually unless you're a sadist. Uh, but this stuff interfaces really nicely with the vehicle creation rules because this gives you a wide variety of things to slap onto the uh, vehicles that your enemies uh, or that the um, either the players are, are uh, strapping onto their vehicles or uh, that uh, the enemies are. So that's where these things fit in. Or if you're doing like a time again, like a time travel thing, you want to throw your players back to you know World War II or World War One or something like that. This is this gives you some some options there. Um, so we've got stuff there, lots of rockets as well, and you know, more obscure weapons, whips and bolas and is that the monofilament bolas? Yeah, that's just fucking horrible. Oh. Um, so the idea that you can toss this thing and then whenever it wraps around you, it cuts through your legs uh, or arms or whatever it catches you on. Um, then we got some uh, demolition explosives here. And then we get some specialized ammo. So if you are uh, playing a character who's a gun nut and you want to have a wide selection of different uh, uh, vehicles, or vehicles, or a bunch of different uh, uh, ammo to go with your slug weapons, this will give you all those options in there. Pretty great, actually. Like they, they have some meaningful changes to the um, to the, uh, to the weapon, or rather to the uh, the effect of the weapon. So that's that's pretty cool. Which gives you another thing. I mean, like because Traveler does not incorporate uh, like a default sort of XP system or advancement system, the mini game that you're playing, you know, when you're customizing your character, it doesn't happen at the character stats and the character skills and the character abilities, it happens with the, the gear you've got access to. So uh, I actually like that a heck of a lot better than the other because it keeps that game in the actual fiction. If you're In order to get access to this ammo or whatever, they've got to be interacting with the fictional world, which is, is great. And then some sighting aids to um, 
uh, to add to your uh, high-tech weapons, things like a personal head-up display or a laser sight down to friend or foe safety. And what's in here again? It's the index, which is great. This uh, index was not in the cool rule book. Uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, Mongoose um, finding the page count to include this in here because this makes it a lot easier to flip through the physical copy of the book. And then we got an ad for High Guard, their uh, Starship book, and then some BS about creating characters online, um, which I have not uh, checked out. And that is that. So um, that is a brief tour through the uh, the actual book itself. Uh, as is probably evidence, uh, I'm a big fan of this product. Like I, I love this book. I think it's. Um, uh, I picked up. Uh, well, I picked up two extra copies of it for my uh, marathon session because I had six or seven players that were playing all in the same place, and I wanted everyone to have. Uh, not everyone. Everyone had a copy of the core rule book, but I wanted enough copies of these kicking around to. Um, uh, for people to review and I also gave one to the guy who hosted my uh, Brent my buddy who hosted us for that night I gave him a, a copy of it as thanks as well, but um, it's a really really great supplement uh, in terms of the immediate supplements that you can get like what if you're Sitting with the core rule book and you're considering what your next You know core supplement is going to be whether it's the central supply catalog the vehicle handbook or high guard I think that the the determining factor, I don't think vehicle will ever be the next thing you pick up. I don't think that's, that's a that's a logical next step. And the reason is, is because if they're going to be, if you're going to be running something where they're really into building vehicles and stuff like that, they're going to be more, your players will be more concerned or they will be concerned about what gear they have as well. So this will really help with that anyway, which means this is probably more important. Um, whereas if you're running a very starship uh, heavy game where there's lots of space combat and uh, you know chases out of the system and shit like that, high guards are really, really probably a better supplement uh, to pick up before this because high guard is a, a dramatic expansion of uh, the available stuff in um, uh, in the core rulebook, including like you know rules for building spaceships. So so that's really helpful. Um, so who, again, who is this for? I, I think, arguably, unless your start, unless your campaign is really about um, a lot of starship combat, this is probably the next thing you should think about picking up for your traveler game. Which, that the traveler core book and this gives you everything your individual travelers could conceivably want. You know, um, there's enough vehicles in the core rulebook for you to fudge your way through until you decide to pick up, or do you? Yeah, uh, you don't want to use enough. You can make up your own rules for for the other vehicles. Uh, High guard. If you do have a lot of uh, starship combat or characters start wanting to build more stuff, or if you want to have access to more samples, high guard will be one afterwards. But this, I think, is the next logical step. This is something that is sort of a um, really like a core cool rulebook point five, right? Like it's it's just there's any any group can make use of this stuff. Whether you're playing scientifically minded characters or traders or mercenaries or spies or whatever this has got shit in it that will help your players and they will love looking through this stuff you know this is a terrific incentive for players to to work towards things you know um all of my players have wish lists already for their travelers for things they want to go and pick up so um yeah and and it's it's a beautiful book so the the Price point on this thing is, I don't remember, It's it was price point for me at 50 US and I live in Canada. So I think I paid 65 for this maybe, 60, 65 uh, Canadian. Um, price point was 50 US when it came out. So you can also get this on uh, PDF and the PDFs that uh, Mongoose releases are, are terrific. I think it's at 20 bucks US on PDF, but I, I, you know what, hold on. Let's, let's make sure that I am accurately describing this. Let's go to the drive through RPG right now. And look it up live. A pull of Bill O'Reilly here. Fuck it, we're doing it live. If I can get to drive through RPG, that is. And I'll tell you what the price point is right now. Next time, I will make sure to look it up beforehand, so I don't have to uh, type shit while I'm doing it, or while I'm broadcasting. So, the second edition Traveler, uh, Mongoose Traveler, Central Supply Catalog is uh, listed at. 
right now. So 2249 for the, the PDF. And you can actually get a, oh cool, they do have a print on demand version as well. So if you don't have a friendly local gaming store near you and you don't want to buy it directly from Mongoose, because you can do that too, you can actually buy a print on demand version from Drive-Thru RPG that will run you 5168 American for copies of the PDF plus the hardcover book. Now, judging on the versions uh, or the, the print on demand stuff that I have received from uh, drive through RPG so far, this is going to be the version you get from Mongoose is going to have nicer paper. Uh, it will be a nicer product than or nicer looking product. But judging from this price, actually, the price is about the same, too. Uh, you're not getting the PDF. Oh, no, you do get a PDF when you buy it from uh, Mongoose as well, too. So maybe your better bet is actually if, if you are interested in picking this up uh, and you can't get it at your friendly local gaming store, maybe Mongoose is your, your best bet then get them from them directly because the this is a nicer finish, uh, both the cover and the interior, than what any one of my uh, print-on-demand books. And, and it's, that's not to say that the print-on-demand books aren't gorgeous. Uh, drive through RPG does a terrific job with them. It's just that it's not the same as, you know, as what you get from a, you know, premium kind of print run that you get from um, from a publisher, from a major, major, uh, major uh, RPG publisher. So, so anyway, that is the uh, Central Supply Catalog. If you have uh, any questions or concerns uh, regarding the Central Supply Catalog uh, or about the Traveler line in general, please don't hesitate to uh, drop me a line. And the way you can do that is either leave a comment in the video below, or you can reach me on Twitter at Dungeon Musings. So uh, Dungeon and Musings, all uh, plural, all one word, at uh, or on uh, Twitter, uh, or by email at Dungeon Musings at gmail.com. So again, it's dungeon musings, all one word, plural, at gmail.com. So uh, last thing I will mention too is again, if, if uh, you have found this helpful, if you found this educational or entertaining, um, please consider clicking through to the um, uh, Heroes uh, Save Villages uh, campaign. Uh, even a dollar donation uh, goes directly to SOS Children's Villages and it, uh, it helps kids. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks as always for viewing, um, and I will be back again soon with another review for another Traveler product. So thanks, and uh, have a great weekend.